To pass this lesson, fill in the blanks and respond to the questions on the answer key to the right. Make sure to pay attention to this course to learn the correct answers. You will see a box like this containing the information you'll need for the answer portion. Pay special attention to the information in bold. Be sure to check spelling when answering. In this course, you will learn about art of the ancient Near East. The ancient Near East is considered the rise of civilization. It followed the Neolithic Revolution and was the first to practice year-round farming. It had the first writing system, included numerous technological innovations, the first centralized government and laws, and the foundation for the fields of astronomy and mathematics. Like the Neolithic Revolution, the ancient Near East took place in Mesopotamia, also known as the Fertile Crescent. It's called the Fertile Crescent because of the richness of the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, allowing for farming and therefore an increase in population. A major part of the Near East was called Sumer, what is modern-day Iraq. Sumer is the oldest known civilization in the world. Sumer, or Sumeria, was made up of city-states, which are cities and surrounding areas, each under their own ruler. The rulers of each city-states were God's representatives on earth. Together with the priests, the rulers planned all activities. Religion was centered to daily life, and every aspect of the culture revolved around the worship of local gods. As mentioned, the first form of writing was developed during this time, around 3400 to 3200 BCE. It started out as pictographs, then developed into cuneiform, scratched into soft clay tablets. By the year 2600 BCE, complex grammar was developed. Like the Stone Age people, Sumerians also created votive statues or idols to use in worship of their gods. You'll notice, however, that the Sumerians added more detail in clothing and facial expressions on their work. In fact, look how exaggerated the eyes can be. These idols were one to three feet in height and made of simple shapes, especially cones and cylinders. Because clay was common in West Asia and stone was not, the earliest statues were made from clay. It's difficult to make sharp edges when working with clay, so many of these statues looked soft and round. Even when the Sumerians began to carve sculptures out of stone, they kept this style. Because religion was the center of Sumerian life, the people built temples to honor their gods. These temples were called ziggurats. Although ziggurats are quite large, most of the structure is a platform for the top tier. Sun-baked bricks make up the core of the ziggurat with facings of fired bricks on the outside. The facings were often glazed in different colors and may have had astrological significance. The number of tiers ranged from two to seven. It's assumed that the ziggurats had shrines at the top, but researchers aren't positive. They were believed to be dwelling places for the gods, and only priests were permitted within, and it was their responsibility to care for the gods and attend to their needs. One of the most famous ziggurats is the ziggurat of Ur. It was uncovered in the 1920s and is one of the best preserved structures from its time. It's unknown how many levels the ziggurat originally had, but researchers use ancient descriptions and representations of ziggurats 
to reconstruct it as best they could in models. The monument itself was repaired so that visitors can climb to the top of the first level. Another example of Sumerian art is the Warka vase, which was created between 3200 and 3000 BCE. It's carved from alabaster stone and was found in a temple built for the goddess Inanna. The vase was used for presenting offerings to the goddess. On the surface of the vase are carvings that depict a scene from a religious festival. When images are carved to appear as if they are raised above a background, it's called relief sculpture. The scenes on the work of vase are divided up into three sections or registers. The lowest register shows animals in strict profile. These images reflected economics, but also fertility. The middle register depicts men carrying jars of offerings of nature's bounty. The top register shows the goddess with the tall horned headdress. Notice that the men in the carving are smaller than her. This is called hierarchy of scale. Hierarchy of scale is when size and space in a picture are used to emphasize importance of a specific object. Because the goddess is larger, it shows that she is more important than the men. Another piece that shows both relief sculpture and hierarchy of scale is the Stele of Hammurabi. Have you ever heard of the Code of Hammurabi? Here's a hint. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Hammurabi was a king of Babylon in the ancient Near East. He is known for establishing one of the first written laws in the world. All 282 laws were inscribed around the year 1750 BCE on a stele, which is a tall, narrow slab of stone. This stele was placed in a public area so that all people could see the laws. The writing was done in cuneiform in the local language of the Babylonians. What's interesting is that it's believed that most citizens were illiterate. That means they could not have even read the laws. Each law had a corresponding consequence for breaking it. These consequences seem harsh when compared to those used today. For example, one of the laws states that if anyone is committing a robbery and is caught, then he shall be put to death. At the top of the stele is a relief sculpture that depicts King Hammurabi receiving the laws from the Babylonian god Shamash. Here, Shamash is shown as larger than King Hammurabi. If the god was to stand up, he would be much taller than the king. This shows how important the god is. The fact that he is shown telling the laws to Hammurabi is to show the people that the laws are straight from the gods and so must be obeyed. Another feature to notice in this relief sculpture is that the artist shows both front and side views of the figures. This is a common practice in ancient art. Another major work of ancient Babylon is the Ishtar Gate, which was commissioned by King Nebuchadnezzar II in approximately 575 BCE. Dedicated to the Babylonian goddess Ishtar, the gate was constructed as part of a major project to beautify the city. Artisans covered it in glazed brick with alternating rows of aurochs, which are an extinct type of cattle, and dragons. The gate was on the northern side of the city, and through it was a processional way. Every New Year's Day, statues of the Babylonian gods and goddesses 
were paraded through the gate and down the processional way. The way was lined with walls covered in lions on glazed bricks. The foundation of the gate itself was excavated in the early 1900s and pieces of it ended up in various museums around the world. The front part of the gate was rebuilt in a museum in Berlin and a smaller reproduction in Iraq under Saddam Hussein's rule. The Iraqi version was not completed and has since been damaged in the war. Nevertheless, the original gate was, for a long time, one of the seven wonders of the world. The ancient Near East represents a broad time frame and numerous cultures concentrated geographically in the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia. These cultures have brought innovations such as year-round agriculture, the written word, centralized government and law codes, art range from Sumerian votive statues to huge monuments such as ziggurats and the Ishtar gates, to art used for governmental purposes like the stele of Hammurabi, and art used for practical purposes such as the warka vase. The ancient Near East was amazing. It's no wonder that it's considered the birth of civilization.